Hi Marvin, thank you so much for speaking to UB TV today. Um, so I wanted to start off by asking you, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your connection to the city of Bristol? Yeah, well, I was, I was born here. This is my city, uh, born in 72. No, I shouldn't have said that, give my age away. Uh, but yeah, and grew up here, moved between St. Paul's, went to live in a refuge for a little while, and then came back to Lawrence Western before moving to Eastern. So my my childhood, my dentist was up in Clifton. And when my mum used to take me there, we used to look at students as though they were something else because university was just a very distant reality to my family. No one had been to university. Um, so it's nice to see the university get more involved in the, the city's actual life. Um, over over recent years. And can you run through your career a bit with me? Um, so obviously the position of mayor was only created in 2012 and you've had a, a long career before you were elected in 2016. You worked in the USA a bit, you worked as a journalist. So could you run through your journey with me and uh, up until you got into politics um, as mayor? So I, I went to Swansea University, drew a big circle and chose all the universities on the coast. That's about as much as I knew about selected. Then straight out of university, um, I went to work for Tier Fund, which is a development agency. It's still around now. Um, and that brought me back to Bristol as a youth coordinator. Uh, so it's basically talking about poverty and trying to get people engaged in, in tackling issues like Jubilee 2000, Fair Trade. I worked for um, an organization called Sojourners, a civil rights organization. Uh, then I went back to the United States, did another, did a second master's and um, uh, worked for Tony Campoli, who was Bill Clinton's advisor, then came back to Bristol to work for the BBC, freelance for a year, went to work in a voluntary sector, Black Development Agency, based down in, on Ruston Avenue, then went to work for the health service on mental health, uh, in public mental health. Um, and then I was there since, really, spent a bit of time with the council, went to Yale University in between that, um, ran in 2012 and lost, ran again in uh, 2016 and won. Brilliant. And can you tell me about your key pledges um, for the next mayoral election? You've spoken a lot about build, building affordable housing. I know that that's high on your priority list. Can you talk yeah. through your key concerns and key policies? Yeah, it's house building. It absolutely um, essential. So the rule, the, you know, the rule stuff is to continue to build um, affordable homes and to uh, build uh, and to also to progress on our mass transit system. Uh, we, we, you know, we need a, a meaningful transport system, not just for a city of 460 odd thousand people today, but Bristol's growing by about 100, uh, by about 100,000 people over the next 25 years or so. So we need a transport system that is fit for a growing uh, population as well. So we don't end up clogged up with cars and, you know, you know, and, and all the rest of it. Um, and leading on from talking about the environment, I know a lot of students uh, are drawn to the Labour Party because they're so of well, their social and economic policies, but they uh, do have quite a high presence in the Green Party because the environment is a strong concern for students. Um, how do you balance making jobs and boosting the local economy with preserving the environment in your manifesto? The reason why I think the Labour Party um, is, is the, the party that understands the environment, because I think for too long the environmental movement to be perfectly frank, has been quite an elitist movement. And by that, I mean, it, it, is, it is mirrored the very same race and class structures that it claims to be wanting to overturn, right? And I'm not ragging on it. We just have to be honest about that. And, and actually, it's that race and class hierarchy of the politics that has given us the world we've given. So unless you're serious about tackling poverty, unless you're serious about recognising the fact that the people get hit first and hardest by climate change look like me and my dad, and come from the, you know have the African heritage, Asian heritage, then I think it's a movement that will 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 lack meaningful political insight, uh, but also won't necessarily build up the uh, the democratic mandate to take action. Obviously, students have quite a particular position in the city because they're obviously contributing to the local economy, but also driving up house prices by renting um, in experience, expensive areas like Clifton, for instance. But a lot of students do wonder how they can contribute to the city in a more meaningful way. So we've done a lot of student integration um, and, and there's different kinds of student experiences in there. So first off, I'd say after Brexit. Uh, we came out of the traps very quickly, worked very closely with Hugh and Guy. In that instance, dare I say, having a brown skin mayor is pretty helpful in terms of telling international students, no, you're welcome here. All right? We are an international city uh, and we're a national city. So actually, people coming from around the, around the country and around the world to Bristol makes Bristol what it is. We did the same during COVID, by the way, um, when there was the, the kind of the little bit of a narrative beginning to brew that it's students coming to Bristol that were giving us additional risk on COVID. We worked a lot with um, 
with, uh, with, with the university, with our director of public health to make sure that students were uh, safeguarded during the whole process, managed and actually made sure that there weren't any rumours going around that ended up with students uh, being targeting. Um, I, I think too, I'd say the one city approach is, is a huge opportunity for students to be involved in the city life. We've stated that we want it to happen. We've stated that students are welcome and are a part of Bristol life. But in terms of the grand goals, the one city approach is an open door because it says, come and make an offer to Bristol and then tell us how you, um, how you um, uh, tell us what you need from us to help deliver it. So I'll give you an example, the Launchpad housing scheme over uh, you know, at the top of uh, Stapleton Road, Fish Ponds Road. That is a project between Bristol Housing Festival, uh, Students Union, um, uh, United Housing and ourselves. What we've done there is we've put up units that um, in which students are living alongside that young people who potentially at risk of, of, of falling off the rails or ending up homeless living together. That's a real housing scheme, an award-winning um, housing scheme. The work on period poverty involves students. The uh, Advisory Committee on Climate Change has university staff and, and uh, students involved and put into. So, so much kind of overlap between the intellectual, intellectual and student firepower of the university and what the city's trying to get done is happening now. And I, I, I would dare suggest that it's happening in a way that it hasn't happened in the city's um, history. I wanted to ask, has the COVID-19 pandemic got in the way of any of your mayoral pledges? Do you think that it's um, inhibited you any, in any way in carrying out um, your manifesto? Oh, yeah. Um, there's not an area of life, really, that COVID hmm. hasn't, hasn't hit. Uh, you know, it's, it's not to some mental health, not to some getting work experience. We had about 56% of our young people when I came in were not getting access to meaningful work experience. And you know which 56% that, that is, right? It's the ones with the, the, the family, the aunts and uncles that don't work for the financial firm, the, the legal firm, or don't work in television production and opens the door. So um, that, that's been knocked. Um, the big knock on mental health, education, attainment, all those things that we talked about, but probably most well known is the knock on housing delivery. There are other things you can add to that, the uncertainty around Brexit in the supply chain. Um, and to be honest, austerity doesn't, do, uh, doesn't help us uh, having the staff to, to get things done. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been a challenging, it's been a very challenging year. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your biggest achievement and then also biggest regret um, as mayor. I imagine that kind of covers the regret side of the question, but could you talk perhaps about your biggest achievement? The biggest achievement is housing uh, because we have built 9,000 homes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I say for all the nonsense that, you know, that can come around and the, the chatter or the social media stuff, you know, I, I, I visit people in their homes. I was in Alderman's Mall. We've got 133 homes going up, 53 of those are council houses. And um, I was on the doorstep with a family. I think they were Kurdish as well. We moved from a tower block. Now they've got a home. It's got ground source heat, so the heating bill's incredibly low and efficient. That's decarbonised as well. Um, you know, they've got two young children. And he was telling me that their, their girls who were just coming into their teens would be walking down the tower block. There'd be the smell of urine. They'd sometimes be drug, drugs. And now they've got this beautiful brand new home. Amazing, that brilliant work. And I wanted to ask you about your personal thoughts. Bristol is obviously in grand scheme of things quite a small intim and intimate place, but it's regularly making increasingly national and global headlines with the toppling of the Corson statue and the recent Kill the Bill protest. Why do you think that it has such a sort of revolutionary sentiment about it? What is it about the fabric of the city? That's a really difficult one. I, 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 I struggle to answer it. I mean, there's always been protest in Bristol. Um, you know, statues have been hauled down before. If you go and watch David Dolasuga's The House Through Time, which is a fantastic, um, B on BBC I play a fantastic series, yeah. you know, about Bristol's history. Um, but, but, but it has been an, an epicenter. And I guess, to be honest, one of the, I guess one of the features that comes with it being the only major city in the, the Southwest, I mean, you go down Exeter, but, you know, it's not kind of thriving down there. <laughs> you know, they, it becomes the place that attracts people. But I just want to say, we don't only attract attention for uh, protest, as, in, as important as that is, and having the voice. Uh, I'm, I'm asked to speak very regularly now. I sit on the World Economic Forum panel on the future of cities, in which we're looking at the future of city finance. I was asked to speak at the United Nations on the Global Compact on Migration, the first city leader to speak in the negotiations over the Global Compact on Migration, sit on the Mayor's Migration Council. We hosted the Global Parliament and Mayors here. These, are good, these, these good stories don't always get told. There's been a huge amount of controversy about the protest, Kill the Bill 
protests um, and it's been spoken about in a quite a simplistic way in the student community it's been either it's great or it's rubbish and I know you're someone that's quite nuanced in your um, analysis analysis of things I saw your channel 4 interview about the Causton statue and you were kind of refusing to give it this is great or this is terrible answer so I was wondering from this perspective what it what would you say to students when they are um, going to these protests and what has you been your take on the violence which has taken place um, on behalf of protesters, but also the violence which has been noted uh, from uh, policemen towards uh, journalists and the general public. So I start with Sun Tzu, who wrote the book, The Art of War, not that we're going to war, but <laughs> and what Sun Tzu says is, um, those who win know they've won before they engage in battle. Don't go into battle and then try and work out how you win. Right? You have to know you've won before you engage in battle. Now, about the protest, I'd say we all want to kill the bill, right? This is a bad bill. Um, it, it, it's not just those people who, tur who turn up to events that where they're choosing to come into, con come into contact with the criminal justice system, police, that, that should be concerned. It's those of us who may get stopped to search when we haven't chosen to put ourselves in situations where we come into contact. So this is a first order uh, concern uh, to me. But any protest has to have a, a clear line of sight from the protest to the outcome it wants. That, that's, that's, for me, that's, that's it. Otherwise, you're just indul indulging a protest, right? So if you look at the Selma Bridge March in, in, uh, that King led, that had a forensic focus on creating a context in which they're going to get a voting rights act in the United States in 1965, right? All protest has to be disciplined and ordered. So the question is, we ask, how do you, how do you defeat the bill? Well, you defeat it where? In the commons, right? Not in the papers, not on social media. You defeat it in the commons and you have to win a vote. So how do you win the vote? Well, the conservatives have majority. So, so to defeat the bill in a vote, by definition, you have to get conservative MPs to vote against their party. You have to get them to vote against the whip. That's a tall order. So at any time we're taking action, any time action is taken, I'm question is, what is the connection between what you're doing and how you get a victory? Right? What's the connection between the protest in Bristol and getting conservatives to vote against the whip? And that, that's the question. Now, it may be that someone has that, but that, that's it. So let's look at Bristol. Now, there is a, there is a case for just raising, and raising it in the public consciousness. Absolutely, there's a case for it. Right? But yeah, if I was deploying my resources, Bristol has got four Labour MPs, a Labour majority on the council, right? an independent police crime commissioner, who's not a member of the Conservative Party, and a Labour mayor. So, OK. Take action in Bristol. That's fine, right? We run, we always respect the right to process and we facilitate that. But show me the connection, because actually, those of us who are going to be taking a paying a disproportionate price for a bill like this haven't got time for people who assume leadership to have bad strategy, right, and make mistakes. That that's 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 the point I made about being people being strategically inept. And then when people smashed windows. Conservative MPs in rural shires looking at a Labour run city with smashed windows, how is that adding pressure to them to vote against the whip? So that's in fact, and my point was actually all you're doing is you're building the narrative that they would want to push through the commons to say, hey, we need more assertive policing. We need more, you know, we need more control because these cities are getting out of control. These protests are getting out of control. So it's nothing about being anti protest. The question is, what's the strategy and what's the connection? Yeah, that's counterproductive to react with violence when you're trying to preserve the right to protest. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think, I think, I think you saw evidence of that in the, in the the week subsequent. So, it, you know, the the action started off talking about kill the bill. Then it started. Then the action was talking about police violence, which I don't condone. You know, right? But it starts talking about police violence, and then there was another action about media bias. So what's happened to the focus? Right, you got a limited amount of time. Right, you've got a finite amount of resource. You know, you, you you don't win if you begin to lose focus. And I think what happened is everyone stopped talking about everything. And so we don't disagree on the, the the you know the bill being a bad bill, being ill thought through, doing the wrong things, not taking account of women's safety, and all these other pressing issues that we've got. The question is, how do you defeat it? And there has to be some honest self reflection about. It. Yeah, and I think in student circles there's also been a, bit, a, lot, a lot of narrative of we're going to take it out on the police because the police needs to be defunded and it's quite a 
simplistic way of um, taking out your anger on one group of people. So that, that is the narrative that um, has been going around uh, the university. We are very concerned now uh, because our chief constable just said he's not going to renew his contract. Andy Marsh is a fantastic chief constable, has been meeting and, and fronting up very challenging issues in the police in a way that we've never had in the city before. Now, I'm not going to say that recent pressure led to that, but I will say that since the Colson statue came down and they policed the Colson statue very intelligently, Bristol has been in the crosshairs of government. So if, if you know, losing his chief constable, I will say, is a, is a conversation that's going around among those of us who work on criminal justice is a real concern for us right now. And what we don't need is um, <clears throat> the Conservative Police Crime Commissioner who wants to lock him up, throw away the key, lining themselves up with the, with the Home Secretary and giving us a Metropolitan Police style Chief Constable. That is immediate negative consequences for people from, from our communities. Again, be careful about the unintended consequences of the actions that you take. Um, you've said that this is the last time you will run uh, for mayor, that you, something new awaits you. What is this going to be? Do you know? Do you know what's next? If you become uh, mayor of the city for the next few years, what will you be doing after that once um, you achieve all your brilliant goals, hopefully? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there'll be things I, I, you know, I've worked in development in the past. I'd really like to, to, to be involved with people looking at city development. Again, around sustainability, the SDGs, um, inclusion. Um, I, um, I've always had that co the commitment to deepening and broadening the talent pool from which, uh, from which our leadership draw. So if you look at the, the reports on social immobility in the UK, uh, we are one of the most socially immobile countries in OECD. I think even in uh, latest reports says, you know, seven, 7% seven of the population go to independent schools and they're over 50%, or probably 55, 56% of our politicians. Can't run a country like that. You know, you don't end up. No, that's nothing. You know, one of my best friends went to boarding school, so I'm not ragging on that, right? But I'm just saying that's not a healthy balance. Um, and so I'm committed again to finding talented people um, from backgrounds who are not represented in leadership, not just political, but the boards of the health service, senior positions in, the, in businesses and supporting them to move into leadership, because I think that is good for the country. There's a report from McKinsey a few years ago that says if you're accessing a diversity of thought, you, your business will outperform the market. It's called Diversity Matters. So companies that put women amongst that leadership thought are about 15 to 18% more likely to outperform the market. You know, and when you, com when you combine that, I put that alongside what they call minorities, obviously people of uh, black and brown people, um, that goes up to about 28% more likely to outperform the market. So McKinsey say, so begin to recruit and exploit a diversity of thought or get left behind. And that's my passion, I think, is a question of individual justice and fairness, but it's good for the country and it is good for our, for our industry.